Okay, um, hi, we are group six from Project B, which um, is which character is the most pressing need for life insurance. Uh, I'm Tui, this is Anna, Georg, and Zubu, and uh, we're going to tell you some basics about Node.js. I'll start with an overview, then um, Anna will dive in a bit deeper, Georg will present to you the Node package manager, and Zubu will present to you our project. So um, let's start with some common problems that we face when developing a web application. Uh, your server has to handle a certain number of parallel connections and sometimes it's just very many connections. You have to set up your web application in more than one programming language. So you can't really work seamlessly between your front and back end. Um, and often it is a very complex realization of um, real-time applications because there are usually no specific structures in most web servers to handle real-time apps. What exactly is Node.js? Um, Node.js was um, developed by Ryan Dahl and presented to standing ovations at the Europe JS Conf in May 2009. Ryan Dahl wanted a better handling of real-time applications. Basically, Node.js is just two things, a runtime environment and a library, which is accessible through um, the Node Package Manager since 2011. And the runtime environment of Node.js enables a server-side execution of JavaScript instead of the commonly used um, client-side in the browser. Uh, Node.js uses Chrome's V8 engine, which was one of the first engines to um, compile JavaScript just in time instead of interpreting it, which um, usually gives a better, a higher performance. Node.js is event-based, obviously, because it's JavaScript. And, um, yes. <laughs> what are some Node.js features that might be useful? First of all, it's highly scalable. I will come back to that at a later slide. It features non-blocking and asynchronous I.O. Um, that is opposed to blocking I.O. If you, for example, imagine that you have a request to a database, you usually wait for the request to finish and then you can process the data. Uh, but with non-blocking I.O., you can just continue your work um, until the database request is finished. You can, um, then you will get a callback, which we had yesterday. And then you, um, and then you can just do all the work without worrying about um, the data from the database, which you can just process after getting the callback. It is single threaded, uh, which can come very handy at times because you don't have to deal with concurrency problems. And its ecosystem provides very useful modules to um, set up a web application. So how important is scalability? Um, I have a nice graph for you. Here, uh, first of all, note that the um, orange linear graph is our Node.js. And um, let's start with the blue graph. It's the speed of the Apache server. And as you can see, up to about 4,500 concurrent connections, the Apache server is faster, has a better performance than Node.js. But afterwards, it kind of goes downhill. And um, even if you theoretically increase the speed by the Apache server through, for example, um, more cores, uh, you cannot reach the performance of Node.js at, let's say, 10,000 concurrent connections or more. So that's what you use Node.js for. If you want to handle a lot of connections, Node.js provides you with a high scalability. So I will tell you a bit more about how Node.js is uh, single-threaded and how the asynchronous I.O. operations exactly work. First of all, the traditional thread model is that we have several threads running at the same time. They run in parallel. So we can have a uh, concept like one thread per request. So we have two requests, get file and get data. Each request um, consists of different operations like uh, get file, open a file, read the file, and in the end, uh, send the file. 
and as we see, the threads are working in parallel, but the operations of the, of the threads are working in a linear way. So for Node.js, we don't have um, different threads for um, every request we have. We have only one thread. You can see by here. We uh, introduced event queue just yesterday. Um, our Node.js application schedules all the things that have to be done in our event queue. You can see it. Um, all the blue operations belong to the get file, and all the red operations belong to get data. Um, in the event queue, you can always see the function and the callback of the function. So, get file um, has a callback open file. Get data has a callback connect data. Uh, the other thing you can see, um, it's not always so that first uh, an operation of get file is done and then an operation of get data uh, is executed, but it can be that two operations of uh, get file are executed immediately after in one another. This is because the connection to the database takes such a long time. Um, we had this already yesterday. Now the question is, how exactly are these operations in the event queue executed and what happens? when they are dequeued. So there's a second concept. Besides the event queue, it's the event loop. The event loop handles all the operations that are in the event queue. It takes the first function in the event queue and executes it. And then we have to differentiate if it's a synchronous or an asynchronous function. So for us, um, a short reminder, what is the big difference? Synchronous functions. Um, are, um, all functions you do basically, except uh, all functions that are not asynchronous. Synchronous functions um, are all executed in one loop of the event loop, so if you have um, several synchronous functions immediately after another, they are all um, executed in one loop of the event loop, and the event loop, that's our thing of thread. That's why uh, Node.js is called thing of threaded or uh, JavaScript and all. At all. Um, synchronous functions block the whole Node.js pro process because they are done in one single event loop, uh, one single looping of the event loop, and um, the event loop is our thing of thread. And, but it's okay if we do synchronous functions as long as they are cheap. Um, a common synchronous function we, of, function we often use is console.log, for example, hello, that's a blocking operation because it blocks the whole um, event loop. On the other hand, we have asynchronous functions. We heard about them yesterday. Those are the ones that provide uh, us with callbacks. Uh, mostly these are the expensive operations like AO operations or database access operations and so on, uh, file system operations. These asynchronous functions are not handled in the event loop. They are handled in the background because they are so expensive and we have to keep our event loop free of long-running uh, operations. And because they are not handled in the event loop, they are not blocking because you can't block the event loop if you are not handled in the event loop. Um, uh, uh, example for this are the uh, I.O. operations. So with this in mind, we can come back to our um, schema of um, how the event queue and the event loop work. The event loop takes the first uh, event that is queued. If it's a synchronous event, it just uh, executes it and goes on by taking the next event of the event queue. If it's asynchronous, it just gives this uh, asynchronous function to a thread out of, out of a thread pool. Um, this thread then uh, executes this function in the background and gives up, fires back the callback or gives us back a response. Are there any questions on this? I will tell a bit more about these threads. Yes? So if these asynchronous functions, are they running in JavaScript or are they just external libraries providing a JavaScript API? So for example, if you have one function which is asynchronous, is it? I, um, yeah. I think um, most asynchronous functions are uh, based on C or C++ functions and these threads out of this thread pool are uh, provided by libuff with is a C or C++ um, library and so that's why they are they can be handled in the background. So there are not any functions running in JavaScript which are basically running the same yes. uh, runtime? Yes. So, okay, yeah. Yes. 
Um, so um, basically, um, JavaScript is kind of cheating because, as we see here, we don't have a single thread. We it is um, basically it is single threaded because we have the event loop and that's our only thread. But we have uh, like four different threads in the background which are executing our asynchronous functions. But you can't. As a dev developer, you can't really see them or use them. You can use them by using asynchronous functions. Um, yes, uh, the number of the threads in the background is usually four because uh, libof writes these threads and the default parameter is four, but you can change the default parameter and you can use more threads to execute your as asynchronous functions. Yes, and I think that's all. Okay, so now that we know <coughs> what Node.js can do and that you can um, execute it on the server side, how do you ex actually execute JavaScript code with Node.js? It's, it's actually really easy. You just have to download, download and install Node.js. Windows support is now also available, which it wasn't before. So before it wasn't possible, you either, either had to use a virtual machine or <coughs> dual boot or just some way to execute it on a Unix um, on a Unix-based operating system. You simply run your code by typing in node uh, test.js in your terminal with test.js being your executable file. And uh, this is great because you don't need any additional script in another, uh, another language like PHP, Java, Python, which without Node.js would, um, yeah, would be impossible. What is the default point that it takes? Sorry? The default port that uh, Node takes. The port? Yeah. It runs on, it listens on. Um, I don't know. Uh, what is the default port? Don't you specify it. Definitely don't need it. 3000. 80, 3000, you have to specify it. Okay. <laughs> So um, what do we use Node.js for? Yes, we already learned that it only has one single thread, actually. So you only use it for operations requiring a limited computational time and effort, which you usually do anyway because it's JavaScript and it wasn't really designed to um, be used for high performance computing. Um, you use it for JSON API based applications, um, which is actually pretty obviously too. Uh, pretty obvious too because um, JSON is the JavaScript object notation and you can just seamlessly let those two work together. Use, you use them for I.O. bound applications um, because it's event based and um, usually there are no preset time intervals between uh, your operations and um, you can just do all the work <coughs> while waiting for operations. And um, you use it for data intensive real time applications because of the non-blocking IO. So that means um, you, uh, Node.js is as slow as the slowest database query only because you only have to wait for the callback and yeah, that's it sweet. So what are some companies that use Node.js? You probably know most of them, if not all. Uh, eBay, PayPal, General Electric, Uber, and Yahoo. And they actually have um, pretty much the same reasons. They just want the same programming language on the front um, and back end. And eBay specifically wants a better I.O. handling of specific services. And um, they mentioned that they wanted to use the high scalability of Node.js. Uh, Yahoo, for example, um, there you probably know their framework cocktail. It is completely based on Node.js. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna give a quick example how to set how to simple this to set up a web server or an HTTP server with Node.js. You just have to require the standard package that comes with, no, with Node.js, the HTTP package, and then this package, this package has, a, has a function, create server. Um, what comes off in the brackets is just what gets executed when someone connects to your server, basically. 
Um, let's skip that for now. And then you um, specify on what port you want to listen with your HTTP server. And then when someone connects to your server, this, func this function gets executed and you can specify what you want to do there. For example, you can set the header of the response. Basically, you can, you can tell them if, it's, if the request worked or if it failed, basically, and different response statuses. And then you can specify some text or HTML, what you want. Uh, yeah? What are the classes of um, codes that you can answer with? Do you have an idea of what numbers stand for? Um, 200 is um, success. Um, 300 is... So 300 is a redirection, basically. And 400 is probably an error. Yeah. So permission or file is wanted. And 500 is got to do with the server itself. Some problem that is okay. Okay, thanks. So you can see it's, it's really easy to set up a web server with Node.js, just need to execute that script with Node and then you can connect to the port and it works. Then I'm going to go a bit into the performance of Node.js. Um, this is a comparison of simple HTTP requests with a hello world re response. And you can see Node.js is pretty high up there in the requests per second it can handle. And PHP, the standard or older language, is really low compared to Node.js. It's just, yeah? Which version of PHP? Not 7. No. <laughs> it's, it's from a year ago, this comparison. Because on 7 they worked highly on performance. Okay, what would you expect them to have in that? Uh, it's close to HHP. Also, uh, uh, with WordPress, normal so HHP is possible. Or half? Sorry? Would it be about double? No, it would be about the level of HHP. HHP. About double? Yeah. Okay. Where, did the, uh, where are those numbers coming from? Um, we have, a, in the end, we have a res our resources. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, this was just a comparison someone, someone did with um, running different lo uh, languages on their server. Okay. And the, the test that was run over here is essentially a simple response? Yeah, simple response. Simple hello world response with just basically the prints hello world to the one connecting. Then um, a bit more computational effort with um, the bubble sorting done. And here you can see on the y-axis it's the response time of the server. And on the x-axis it's how many elements were in the uh, array basically that was bubble sorted. And as you can see in the beginning they're all pretty similar, PHP, HVM and Node. And then PHP suddenly spikes or goes up um, because HHVM and Node are compiled and PHP is just interpreted. And then um, they are much faster with more elements in this computing. Then the next one is serving static files. Here the um, purple one is no chest. You can see it's really low. And on the y-axis, again, it's request per second. And on the x-axis, it's concurrent clients that request your static files. And as you can see, on this one, it's comparing web servers, not um, languages. And Node.js is pretty bad compared to the other, uh, the other web servers when serving large static files. So you shouldn't use Node.js just to serve static files, it's more for dynamic content. Okay, what well, would you do that? You still 
still have to serve uh, large static files at the same time that you're running uh, an old uh, application. What do you do? You can also run an Apache server mm -hmm. simultaneously. So you're reading from the same, once again, you're listening to a single port. Yeah. So how are you going to offload? How are you going to uh, route uh, the different requests? Mm. Reverse proxy. Yeah. yeah. What's that? Reverse proxy. Explain. You would put Apache on AD and then reverse proxy onto your Node.js server uh, over port 3000 or something. So Apache forwards all the requests to Node.js. Mm. We're using FCGI and SCGI. So an interface which lets applications have a communicate with each other in the web server. Right, so you, have a, you either have a proxy, essentially routes the, the request, or what was the second thing? Uh, yeah, CGI interface, so for example, CGI. CGI. Yeah, CGI. CGI. All right. Okay. Um, that's it about the performance. Now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the NPM or Node Package Manager. Um, it comes now packaged or bundled with uh, Node.js. So if you have Node.js installed, it automatically has NPM installed. What NPM does is it provides you with Node.js packages through the NPM the registry and it allows you a very easy installation of those packages just by running a simple command. And to give you a small overview of the size of NPM, it currently has about 250,000 packages hosted and about 900 million downloads per week. So that's really high. And I couldn't get a new number on how many packages there are per week published, but on January 2015, it were about 6,000, but that number should be a lot higher now. Does that include yes. updates? What? Does that include updates? Or is the it downloads? Or? No, that you pay packages per week. I think it does, yes. Okay, so how do these packages work that you get through the NPM? There is this variable in Node.js, it's the module.exports and there you can specify what functions or variables you want to provide to any file that's requiring this file. So if you for example have this file here, it specifies that you have these two functions and then it says how, they, how you want to call them. And you need to use this notation, not the other notation where you define function and then the function name, because this um, basically says it's, it's the object or uh, notation from JavaScript, and you need to use this one to define what you want to export. And then what you also need, uh, this one you can use for any file and then just require it with the file name locally and you don't and you can just include files and other files and if you want to make a whole package for npm out of that you also need the package.json file where you specify a bit of information about your package like the name the version and important all your dependencies um, the other packages you depend on and you want automatically be installed when npm install is run so that your package works even when the user doesn't have all the dependencies installed already. You can also do a bit more here but it's not required. So some problems of npm. You have the problem with dependencies. Um, it's Basically, because you can't control, if you make a package, you can't control what the packages you depend on, depend on because you're not developing these packages. So, if you depend on version 1.0 of a package 
And this package depends on version 1.0 of another package. And then um, the package, the, the other package depends on gets updated. Every time node uh, npm install is run, it basically takes the newest version of the package um, of the package that you depend on that satisfies the dependency you specify and you don't only specify a version, most, uh, most of the time you specify a selector basically. So you want every version that's below or 1.0 basically for example. And if then a package gets updated and it's in this dependency selector then it installs a, the new version. But if a package get up, gets updated, maybe it changes something, for example, a function name or, or something like that, that you used, and then your stuff doesn't work anymore because this function you call doesn't exist because they changed the, na the name, for example. And this can be a real problem, so when you do, uh, publish your package and then someone installs it, but another package got updated and broke basically your package, then your package doesn't work anymore. But there is a solution with the node package man manager for that. You can run the npm shrink wrap command and that basically specifies in your package.json file exactly what versions uh, should be used and not only for your dependencies but also for the dependencies of your dependencies basically. So it goes recursively over that. Any questions about that? Because it's a bit more difficult. Okay. So I'm not the same story is that at the end of the development of uh, a prototype or whatever, you want to run that one script to have yes. sure that the dependencies are always going to be the right one. Yes. Um, it's, um, you should make sure that everything works on your end because it uses what version you have installed, basically, to determine what should be used. And another problem with NPM is because there are a lot of packages um, and a lot, of, a lot of updates and new packages published, basically the quality of those packages can't be assured because you can't look through the code of all those packages and verify that they're working perfectly and stuff like that. And the NPM, the, um, the developer of NPM, basically said that only 50%, around 50% of the packages on NPM are actually good quality. So you really need to make sure before you install a package that that package has good quality because otherwise it might have security issues or something like that. So it is not very good for your package if you depend on a package that's bad quality. And how is quality being uh, measured? Um, measure, it's not really measured, but it's just... Uh, yeah, um, the, the developer of NPM, how he determined um, the the quality or the good quality um, packages. He basically looked at if they have a good documentation mm -hmm. and if they have a GitHub, a public GitHub repository, so you can look at the code and then you can determine for yourself basically, or you can always make an issue there or determine for yourself if, if the code is really good. So the code is public available and it has a good documentation. So you can always look there what all the what all, what the package basically does. Just last side, remember that in science everything is measurable and computer is Yeah, measurable. yeah. <laughs> is that a definition for standard? Otherwise you don't call it science, that's one way of putting it, yeah. What? It's, uh, you could argue that otherwise you don't call it science, right? It's not English or philosophy or something. <laughs> yeah. But, but they, they, they make it back to this point. So in principle, what you now call this criteria. So when you, when you use a package, you want it to work, right? Yeah. You know, somebody, nobody can check the code, nobody can read it, who cares? 
as long as it works. Yeah, but you can't basically be sure that it works. And, and you can't be sure that there is no security issues or stuff like that. Maybe it works, but there are security issues with the package and you don't notice them because you bas can't read the code that of the package. Smart, right? You come up with a, with a, with a statement. So maybe they are security. Yeah. So we're reading the documentation and we are, we are looking at the code. So does that give us confidence that there are no security issues? If you know something about security? Yeah. This is how science works, right? Give me another argument. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so everything clear now? <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, um, right. So that's the part about Node.js basics. Any questions about Node.js? Yes. <laughs> it says that uh, Node.js has great scalability. And how would you scale it? Like, I'm not asking for more details and for some support of production. What would be the easiest way to scale it considering Node.js wants in a single track? How to do it? Um, to test the scalability. Not to test to scale it, but actually to implement the certain degree of scalability yourself. Um. <laughs> okay, anyway, anyway, I'll simplify it. Okay, forget everything I just said. So you said it scales in a real nice way. How exactly does it scale? Uh, well, it can handle a lot of concurrent connections at the same time. So. That means that um, it but can. It's not scalability. If I can handle, for example, I don't know, 100,000. Yes, but um, the, it can still handle the uh, a certain amount of requests per second. Um, and. Um, <laughs> yeah, if I can point out to the slide which we had about uh, yeah. performance and scalability. So it's just that uh, we could consider performance and scalability as orthogonal issues, meaning which uh, let's assume that you want to scale with uh, for with more number of connections, it's likely that your performance is going to be impacted. Uh, if you see uh, Apache, it might give a higher performance with uh, like less number of connections initially, but uh, as the connections increase, then as it like you have more connections, then um, it uh, you can see that Node.js gives a like a linear performance? Yeah, but how does it achieve this in linear performance? And where is this graph, a graphic coming from? Because you also brought up Uber as an example. And for example, Uber switched from Node to Go because it didn't scale. Yeah, so I, don't know to use it anymore. I think there's one more uh, slide where we see Go has a more yeah. superior performance than this shows Node. linear performance, or more or less linear performance. So it should scale, right? But how does it do it? And where is the graph coming from? Because they don't think it is valid. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm not sure about how, how Go uh, has no, 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 superior no, performance. Go, but, but ground, because linear performance like this is not possible, I guess. Uh, well, can you tell us how does it scale? Huh? What? Can you tell us what would you do if you wanted it to scale? Uh, remove them, because... <laughs> 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 Why? I didn't hear it. Because how do you scale nodes? It was said that Node.js breaks out this if you add more machines, then with the number of the second machine, you get more requests. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that would be a proxy, yes, but what if you just wanted to scale it on a single machine? More. Like, you're more it's single threaded. <laughs> single threaded or more, and you do what? You can make clusters and fork all the CPUs, and then you can use all CPUs on one machine. Yes. And by default, Node isn't using all CPUs on one machine. It's one thread, 500 megabytes of RAM, and I don't know how much of the CPU can be up after a single thread in the past. <coughs> very important. So whenever you want to make it a little bit faster, you just, there's, it's really simple to just say, spawn all the processes that you can, all the threads that you can for the process. And if one thread dies, just spawn another one. So, Okay.
Anything else? Okay. One thing to make over there, do you have uh, the uh, response in the video back to the slide? What? Which one? The slide where you had the, uh, where you were creating the server and having the response kind of This one? Yeah, this one. So potentially I can write my entire uh, application into this uh, server JS. Basic, basically, yes. Basically, yes. So I can essentially overwrite any HTTP uh, headers here. I can uh, any HTTP re uh, responses could essentially be written be written here. Yes, I think so. Okay. So uh, basically, once again, what what are we saying in this example? That basically, if someone connects to the server on the port 8888 or 18 less, um, do we um, respond with the header 200? And, the he and in the header, there's also the content type defined as text. Mm -hmm. And then we write to the basically the response body. The hello world string. Right. And what is the required HTTP gives us? Um, that gives us the package that's standard in Node.js that creates that server and listens to that port. Basically, the require HTTP um, gives us the, the HTTP variable, and this and then you can use the function in the HTTP package, the create server function that comes from the HTTP package and that's why we need to use the require HTTP because that's how you include packages and other files in Node.js. Alright, and um, when, you, when you're when you when you starting to write the Node.js uh, application, usually it comes with a, some kind of a template, right, that uh, gives you uh, the starting of a, of a server. Have you encountered this? No. no. Alright. We would need an example posted on the, on the groups. For what? For the uh, Node.js application. How did, we, we said how we just need to execute that file in the, with the node command or... This one? Yeah. Okay. And then you um, can go to your port if, it, if, the port, if your port is open. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to the port on your local host. And then there is going to be that re response. Right, this one only uh, handles uh, one request. No, it's um, if you, ev everyone that it connects. Only, uh, it would only respond with one, with one response. Not yeah, one, yeah. One there's no, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're connecting to that part, you're going to get that response. Right, and I would need to see something that handles more than, uh, than uh, yeah. success response. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want, a bit more control, you need to define routers and route diff to different... And that's what I'm kind of missing in this. Yeah. Uh, if you want to have something like a path that you go to and then you need to route to different files or different code, mm -hmm. you need to see what path he connects to, the user. Can you please show us on the groups, just send us an example of how this is being done? Because we don't have it here. Yeah, but I thought that was some other group that did that because I included that file uh, example and I was said I shouldn't do that. Okay. Because. <laughs> I, I don't know, it was. Um, <laughs> no. Um, All right, bring, um, it back. Okay. bring the file back and close it. No, it, it was about uh, another package for Node.js, mm -hmm. the express package, and that's basically, yeah, that was, I think that the other group the th the does that, and that's a better routing example, and stuff like that. So you want us to answer? Or? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, um, let's see what the next group presents. And then yeah, I, I, can, I, I can write with the Google group, right. if you want to. Skip to the, uh, okay.
Okay, uh, hi everyone, I'm Subhu and uh, our project is to predict probability of death for the characters in uh, the Song of Ice and Fire. So to look at some quick numbers, uh, there are around 2200 characters and uh, in which like 500 of them are confirmed dead. And our task is basically to assign uh, the likelihood of death for the remaining alive characters. Uh, here, we, if we assume the state of uh, a character being dead or alive as an outcome, we could come up with features which could contribute to this outcome. And uh, we could list them out as like the title, age, and uh, uh, stuff like this. So uh, here we use support vector machine to help us out with this prediction. Uh, support vector machine is a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, like if you pass a data set with like uh, n samples, in our case n characters, and uh, each character has a set of features and an outcome whether it's dead or alive, then uh, SVM can build a model with which if you pass uh, a new character with just the features, it can predict uh, what is its outcome. Uh, to show this visually, uh, you can, uh, like this, the points here are like the characters and the position of them is like based on the values of their features. So SVM basically tries to create a line or in higher dimension a hyperplane which separates the alive ones from the dead ones. So if you pass a new character once this uh, SVM is trained, it could uh, like based on the position it identifies uh, based on new character's features, it can like predict whether the character is dead or alive. Uh, but in our project we don't actually uh, predict the new character's uh, classification per se, but uh, we are trying to get a probability score for the characters to be either alive or dead. And this score uh, is like a confidence measure of uh, how much percentage it is to be classified either dead or alive, and that value we assign it as the uh, percentage likelihood. And uh, one more thing is like, uh, uh, it is not always possible to have a linear separation uh, from a data set. Sometimes it is not possible. So uh, SVM uses uh, kernels. Uh, what these kernels are, are like, they're just uh, functions which uh, transform these nonlinear, I mean, if, if the data set is not uh, separatable linearly, it just transforms into a higher dimension where it is linearly separatable. So the bottom line is like uh, the result or prediction of the SVM algorithm is uh, heavily dependent on two factors. One is like the values of the features and also uh, the parameters used by the uh, SVM. For example, uh, like uh, if you take a, a polynomial function as a kernel function, the degree of the polynomial function can affect the prediction algorithm. And uh, another technique which helps to get a good prediction is cross-validation. Uh, this is just to make sure that uh, our algorithm is not too dependent on the training set and actually does some good job with uh, uh, a new set, uh, with a test evaluation set. So we divide the entire set, for example, our 2,000 characters into like say 10 sets, and uh, we like uh, 10 sets of 200 characters each, and uh, we uh, we train the algorithm with like uh, 1,800 characters and test it with the remaining 200. Like this is done for all the 10 sets, so with which we can. Uh, get a good uh, uh, like a model which has like a, the mean uh, classification error which is like reduced and stratified cross validation is just an extension uh, here we just ensure that each of the set has like the same ratio of the two uh, labels that is like uh, for example each 200 character should have a, a one is three one is to three ratio of dead or alive characters and uh, yeah, the major task from our project, so uh, we had to initially fetch the character details and features which could uh, likely impact uh, whether they're being dead or alive. And uh, initially we had to run some tests on Wake Up before uh, implementing SVM in JavaScript. Uh, like this is to see how well the algorithm performs and to see which are the features which are contributing effectively to the, uh, to the prediction. And then uh, comes the SVM implementation, and uh, the last part is like uh, display some visualization about the 
the, para, uh, the features which contribute the most to the prediction and also like uh, assign these uh, probabilities to these characters. And the uh, resources we used, uh, apart from the database and wake up, we have used uh, Node SVM. This is a package which, uh, which is based on the uh, popular libSVM package. And uh, yeah. okay, uh, like the, our preliminary project results. So uh, initially we were asked to uh, like select some features and try testing it in wake up. So to do that, we were asked to convert these features into uh, this ARFF file format. So we wrote a converter for it. And then uh, we tested with uh, different data sets and uh, like uh, uh, different parameters for the SVM. So some results which we got. Uh, so here, like uh, we have used uh, four of the features, title, bond, culture, and allegiance. And uh, if you see uh, the, red, the red ones are the uh, errors, which were wrongly classified. For example, the number 431 is the number of dead characters which are classified as alive. And uh, we are informed that uh, this is a, a pretty bad algorithm because uh, this number should... It's pretty optimistic to bring everybody back from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, it, uh, so it wouldn't be a good uh, uh, algorithm to uh, give like to classify the alive people as dead. So we were to bring this 431 number down. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you just hit the, you hit the pop that, that makes me nuts. Uh, you don't have an error estimate and no way in hell you can convince me that your estimate is right to four digits behind the, uh, no. yeah, this, is, this is, Something very no, uh, it is like put down numbers unless okay. you can really support them. Again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fighting this fight in every paper that I review. Or I'm an editor for. This is not the first time. Don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the first, you hit me. Bad luck for you. Uh, but, <laughs> but 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 never never do that. This is total nonsense. Uh, you keep it down. Maybe a 77 is is right. Maybe I'm not sure. I believe it. Uh, but clearly the. Oh, the 3.3602, clearly not, and the same down on the table. Whenever you, in the future work that you do, your master, whenever you put down numbers or number of digits, think or, or argue for what level of precision you can really give. And give error estimates. This is a general statement. Sure. Okay? I said my thing. Never do it again. Okay. I understand the next slides will happen. I will try. Okay. Not it. So uh, what we did was try to add more features. Uh, in this case, we added uh, book appearances of the character and then like uh, assigned like a, a Boolean one true if uh, the character appears, otherwise zero. So uh, like here, if you see uh, at least the misclassification percentage is similar, but uh, we kind of brought down the number of dead characters being alive from 431 to 400 and uh, like there is a very slight improvement if you notice the ROC value as well. It improved from 0.447 to 6.692. Uh, however, this is still uh, bad and. Uh, the rank. Uh, sorry. The rank is dropped. The ROC or. Yeah, I meant the ROC. No, value. What's the rank? What's the rank? What's the rank? What's the yeah. Uh, first number uh, yes. So uh, this is like um, uh, how much uh, attribute contributes to the prediction. The single attribute. Yes, a single letter. By, by, by RUC or what? No, this is uh, just like we tried with uh, a ranker uh, search algorithm, I think. I'm not sure the name. Uh, we got this numbers from Waker. Okay. So, yep, like uh, as I said, like uh, algorithm is still uh, bad. And uh, we would be testing with more features and also try to see which parameters might what is, what provide a better result. column next to the, uh, next to the feature name? Um, these four, uh, four, two, three, one. So uh, this is like the initially. Uh, so culture was the first value. It's like the index of the attributes. So at the end, basically, it gives uh, like a ranking. The fourth value is like a better contributor. So if you look at the eye and the misclassified characters, 
then maybe you can see a pattern why they're being misclassified. One of the reasons could be that they don't have enough features to describe as characters. So maybe it makes just sense to be around. Yeah. So have a look at this misclassified. Yes, I'll have to look. Ally on that characters. What's going on? What's going wrong there? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So I would just like to point out a problem we faced during the uh, uh, SVM implementation in JavaScript. So as I said, we used Node SVM and uh, we observed that initially uh, when we used a polynomial kernel, the algorithm took a very long time. It took over an hour and there was no, uh, like there were some errors saying that the maximum iterations have increased, I mean they've reached. So, and then we uh, uh, searched a bit and found out that, uh, so uh, using a different format, which is like the, called the libsvm format, uh, using this, the, the execution time reduced to under a minute. So, uh, what it does is like, uh, if we have the initial format with the first few values are the features and the last value is the label. So, in this uh, libsvm format, uh, the features are represented in this uh, index Col uh, colon value format. So as the fourth value is one, we have four colon one. And uh, the thing is like, uh, this is a sparse data format, meaning which the zeros are all ignored and only the non-zero values are present in the data set. The font? Uh, the font? Performance. Yeah, performance like uh, uh, with like, for example, polynomial kernel with degree two, uh, for the sparse data format, we got around a minute to for the execution to complete. Uh, but in the other... I don't care about time. What's the final... How many dead in the lag are right? Yeah, it's still... Is it different? Oh, you're not through. No, it is still uh, back in the performance. I mean, okay, time... If your thing runs for one hour, time is not an issue. Uh, Basically, you really want a solution, right? Yeah, you, what did you do this night? You could have run it, right? Yeah. But this may be worse. So usually my experience is that sparse data is performs worse. What you really want is, like, you care really for the ones who you mm -hmm. yep. although they're not dead, that is what you would care for. Um, so that is what you want to minimize. Uh, yes, but uh, like, the uh, thing was like, it was the same parameters, however, uh, this format, uh, and uh, this format took a very long time, and I just research, uh, like Googled a bit, and they somewhere yeah, it, it, it can, it can work, but, but again, very often it doesn't. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the, final, the final goal is for you, don't kill too many. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> he cares more about the ones in here. Uh, the, the other thing is, did you try, why, why you settled on the SVM? Why didn't you run the whole Weka package in private? Uh, Node Weka, uh, we just looked about it, but the thing is, uh, it is just a wrapper to call Weka, just calls Java basically, and we thought uh, it wouldn't be good to. For the course. For this course, yeah. Fair enough. But you could still look, right? Yeah, maybe if uh, we no, try. Come on, if you could get a, a significantly higher with, with some other classifier, mm -hmm. uh, just just toss it in and see. Maybe there will be, if, if you really need, there will be JavaScript library. Because ultimately, you're also building a website. I mean, this is why, why many people would care about it, because you produce something that the world will see. Okay, mm -hmm. you learn about JavaScript, you know, but ultimately, it's a means to an end. And mm -hmm. if you could do better by forget about the JavaScript part and suddenly get a better prediction, right? Yep, we will consider that as well. He's and the teacher. He, he will say I'm wrong, but no, 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 <laughs> be practical. <laughs> be practical. So who's that next? Um, sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, the thing is, like we got the. Uh, uh, percentage likelihoods, but again, the prediction was not. I mean, the uh, algorithm performance is bad, so we didn't put up the numbers. Okay, can you get back to the numbers? Now that you attack yourself. Uh, so, when you say this is not good, what is your state? Why do you say that? Uh, like, we. Compared to what? Yeah, I mean, make, um, not compared, but if you predict. 400 people or 500 to be alive, but they're actually dead. You're basically... You bring it into a very emotional discussion, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody of us wants to be dead because of some wrong prediction. I, I come, I'm, I'm with you. But look at the 77. Yeah. So is that something that shocks you or because it's not 100? Did, did you expect 100? No, 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 no. No. We just wanted to try and improve 
the number, basically. So are you good or not? So what do you compare yourself to? Um, hmm? Yeah, I would probably would like a value where uh, the dead values are lesser, but at the same time, um, these alive values are more. So this will have a no, no, good trade-off. Back to what Chris said. We are we are scientists. We measure mm -hmm. things. Okay. We don't give an emotion. I mean, emotion is great. It's science about passion, but but numbers give me numbers. What do you expect? What what, what could you compare yourself to? Mm -hmm. I just think that uh, 400, um, only for the dead ones, 400 healthy classified people is just relatively very bad. So maybe we want to at least have half of them correctly classified before thinking of using the... But again, so these. now you, you do give me what I want, the number, but uh, I still lack the logic. Factor of two is always good. Maybe five or maybe thin, if you can think of it, two eyes. Uh, but is there any other? So could, could you think about a way in which you could sort of say, okay, this is, is there any other way you could look at this? Is there any other person you could put up or, or uh, artificial method that you could put up to be? Mm. Well, one is very simple, right? What's the random number? It's a half. No. Or what, no, what, what random number do you mean? The random number is not a half. Yeah. What? Uh -huh. You're not picking 50-50. You, no. you have, have 500 yeah, okay. alive and 2,000 something. No, 500 dead and 200, whatever the number was. I can't remember. Yeah. But it's clearly not 50-50. Yeah. So is that close to the random? It's actually just close to the random. Maybe, so, I, I really do not know, but this is something, just throw a random yeah. classifier and see. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. uh, another way, back to Tanya's question. I mean, since you have a crossfold the splits, uh, you could imagine that you have a crossfold for, 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 I don't know, for the next, for the next uh, one that comes out. And on the internet, maybe you can just grab predictions from people. Ah, there you don't know, right. But you could do the same thing for going back in the, can you know, do you have data for that? For what? For you could look what did people predict on Flickr uh, in whatever, I don't know the series, December or whenever the last one came out, before the last one came out, and now you could pretend that you had to predict it. Would you do better than people on Flickr? Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of like the first one who knew this. But, uh, but Flickr, Flickr, I mean, there must be discussions somewhere. Right? Oh. Who's going to go? Yeah. No? Do you, do you have data for that? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, but that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting song to actually see. So the, the, the background issue is sort of a general issue. When you apply machine learning, you always have to come up with an idea. What do you expect? So you're, you say that emotionally I don't like format that this is a big number. Like, I see your point. But is there something that you can measure? Random is for instance one thing that you can measure. Okay? Maybe there, there is a sort of way of doing it just using one fe feature title. That would be stupid, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or, or pick one and see how well would you do. Uh, how, how well does it actually work if you only use one feature? Uh, again, so my point is try to, to, to understand better. I understand you try to do the best you can. Yeah. But in, in, at some point you will be asked, do you feel you're good enough to put it on the web or not? And at that point, you, if that really is random, you would then answer no. If that would be, if it ran, would be 50%. Yeah, that yeah. is not. But then you would, and I would argue, you're way better than random. Just work a little bit on the 400 that, that you both don't like. Possibly have the machine run. So how can you actually sh change the, to tweak the ratios? Uh, you, you, you want to yeah. power out. I you have the power adapter? No. <laughs> oh, let's talk about it. Yeah. OK. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can you? That's the end of the talk? No, I'll take my laptop. <laughs> uh, so, how could you, how could you change? So, when you, if you care most about the ones you predicted there, uh, who are still alive, how could you change the uh, you of the SVM to focus more on them? So, what 
you try this, you change the input. Oh. And that is, it could work, but it somehow so far, you at least cannot prove that it did work. What else could be here? Anybody in the room? You could what? change the Dog. parameters for the SVM. Yep. What part? What part? The, the degree or the different parameters you set for the... Yes, you could, but that is essentially what you're trying. Yeah. What else could you do? Anybody, yeah? If you're looking at the values which uh, were classified wrong and look why they're wrong and maybe run another algorithm on them to retest yeah, That's what Tanya said. That actually is what many people try and very often it doesn't work. Uh, but yes, you can. And it, it, we have examples in our group where this worked. Yes. Uh, but I meant something much simpler. So when you look at the numbers again, go one slide back, please, uh, 30, 31 or whatever that is. Uh, so is there anything that sort of, essentially the, 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 the TP rate or precision and recall rate are very different, right? Or the, the, there's an imbalance in the mistake you make. And that imbalance, again, I didn't complete the numbers, but this imbalance looks somehow, to me, proportional to the data. Mm -hmm. Meaning you have fewer dead, and somehow you, you, you make more mistakes. So what you could simply do is present, so you present the 50-50, but the data is not 50-50. Yeah. Maybe you could present it in the, in the way it's there. That would clearly give you more focus on the ones that are alive. That, Overall, then, it will, in fact, reduce the, the uh, rock area, the area under the curve that you see. Uh, overall, it will reduce all kinds of numbers, but it clearly will get, no, not clearly, most likely will get to 400 down. So this is the safest, the simplest way. Yes, sometimes doing something else on it does work, but the simplest way is to change the distribution. Okay. Try that, if that's what you care for. Okay. But again, whatever you do, remember that at least random, or, 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 I think about something that is a little bit better. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you, you, you're connected to the second one from me. You're connected to somebody who is dead. Uh, just find something that, that is not random and it's still sort of simple. Uh, how well does that do? And if you're not substantially better than that, so you, everybody who's connected to the dead ones has a higher probability and then you do random. And if you cannot even beat something like that, then it's not good enough, right? But again, seven. Okay. Are you going to see a suggestion of how you want to visualize these results? Uh, f suggestion from. Can you tell us what's the idea of how you want to change the phrase? So, uh, like, we thought to um, uh, run the algorithm and place the PLOD in the database directly and uh, about the statistics from the algorithm, for example, the feature weight. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if we will do the visualization or Project F will do, but uh, I think uh, we will give it this in a good format for them to uh, work with some visualization tools like D3Js. We will discuss it with Project what F. What are you generating? You're generating just one value, right? For each character? Yes. And that's it? Uh, yes, that is one thing, and uh, about the uh, uh, statistics about the algorithm for uh, like uh, for the instructors, maybe that thing we can uh, uh, generate and save it somewhere. Well, I think one thing that would be, be very helpful here is we know what features, for instance, uh, yes. help you rank it. Rank it not for the not for the, the tutors, but that we can actually present. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, maybe. We've calculated this value because we think that the allegiance of this character has contributed, mm -hmm. you know, X percentages to this uh, to this uh, prediction. Okay. Great. Just just looking at the pictures, um, that I see book one, two, three. That means it was mentioned first in book one. No, it is just a character's appearance appearance in a book. Exactly. Just uh, mentioned sorry. first. No. If it, it's it's a boolean value, if the character has been mentioned in that book. Oh, at all. At all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, one yeah, one feature that, that I remember that we uh, suggested was essentially um, relationship to a dead character. But that is 
No, it's not allegiance is uh, to what allegiance house or to what right. group oh. they are associated. But uh, relationship to that character may yeah. help you there. But it seems to not. You used that, right? You used everything that you had as input features. Yeah. Uh, no, we used good. everything. We, we got uh, chaser, uh, a chasing data um, in, as the database from group A was not ready. We got some JSON data, but it had not all the features we could possibly get. So use more features. Yeah, that's what we're trying. All right, we're running a little bit over, so let's take a five-minute break. Okay. And then next week. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.